This is a recording of the technical seminar presented by Dr. Ratan Lau for the 2024 Roscoe Ellis Jr. Lectureship in Soil Science at Kansas State University. Dr. Lau is a distinguished university professor of soil science and director of the CFAES Ratan Lau Center for Carbon Management and Sequestration at The Ohio State University. Dr. Lau's presentation is on soil and the global carbon cycle. Now, think, now try it. That again. Yeah, okay, very good, thank you. So thank, uh, once again, thank you so much for uh, the opportunity to be here as a speaker for a, a very prestigious Cross uh, Palace Memorial Lecture. Uh, the topic on carbon cycle, I thought it's important to begin soil, the driver of the wheel of life. And that comes from, I've been talking about Sir Albert Howard, uh, his book, uh, in which he shows how soil drives uh, everything else. Uh, producer, consumer, decomposer, microbiota. And today Dr. Rice is here. Obviously, we know that part. Uh, uh, more than a stars. So that's the cycle that begins. And of course, uh, there are many other uses of soil beyond um, uh, food production, beyond food and fuel. And we shouldn't forget those. I mentioned several times yesterday and during the discussion of a different group, environment moderation, climate buffering, denaturing pollutants, uh, many of the students are working on cover crops and water quality, et cetera, and gaseous exchange and biogeochemical cycles. <clears throat> cycling of water, carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, sulfur, they go together. We study them differently. That's uh, the way we are, but uh, they all go together. Cation exchange, uh, raw material and foundation, structural foundation, antibiotics. 95% of all antibiotics come from soils. So that's very important part. Of course, the repository and archive of gene pool and biodiversity, planetary and human history, paleoclimate, and of course, cultural arts, peace, spiritual, I mentioned yesterday, uh, spiritual aspects of soil, and of course, human health, one health concept. So this part out of this, I'm going to talk only about uh, carbon cycle today. But I want to make sure that uh, those of you who deal with carbon uh, and soil, its activities go beyond just climate. So what the carbon cycle then? It's the biogeochemical cycle by which carbon is exchanged between Earth's four systems. And the four systems are atmosphere, hydrosphere, biosphere, and the lithosphere, rocks, the parent rocks. And in conjunction with the water and nitrogen, carbon cycle comprises a sequence of events that are key to making the earth capable of sustaining life. It's uh, very important in that respect. And the carbon cycle describes the movement of carbon as it is recycled and reused through the biosphere. So that's carbon cycle. Then comes the question of carbon budget. What does that mean? Uh, it refers to the balance of the exchange in terms and losses of carbon <clears throat> or between the carbon reservoir or between one specific loop, such as atmosphere, pedosphere, atmosphere, biosphere loop uh, of the different cycles. A quantitative assessment of the carbon budget or of a pool or reservoir is needed to determine whether it is a source or sink of carbon dioxide. So soil carbon budget is done to find out whether a given practice of management of soil is a source or sink of carbon. And our goal is to make soil and agriculture a sink. And that's why doing carbon budget becomes very important. The global carbon budget uh, comprises of the different components between the atmosphere, the terrestrial biosphere, the ocean, uh, this computer can only count one. You know, that's all you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I didn't bring it with me. It was computer. Yeah. So that's how it is. 
it, it was one, two, three, four, but uh, this is what happened. I prepared things on uh, Mac and this is fairly not Mac. So it, the global carbon budget it involves all these uh, components. So how did the carbon discovery cycle happen? Uh, the carbon cycle was initially discovered by Joseph Priestley and Antoine Lavoisier, late 18th century, and it was popularized by Humphrey Davy and pictures of all those three uh, are here. The principal carbon reservoir which are involved in the carbon cycle and their pool approximately, atmosphere 880 gigaton, gigaton. And uh, ocean, the largest 38,400 gigaton. And it has inorganic and organic components, organic is smaller one and for the surface layer is small part compared to the deeper ocean. Then there's a lithosphere, which is a very, very large, it's a 60 times 10 to the 6 petagram, very large. And carogens are the plant biomass which are compressed within the rock. The terrestrial biosphere contains about 2,000, of which living is 600 to 1,000, dead about 1,200, aquatic about 1 to 2, and the fossil fuel. Of course, the soil part, which I will describe in more detail in a few minutes. Now, fossil fuel, which is um, Many times people used to think they're going to run out of it. No, they got 4,130 proven, and we use only 10 gigaton a year. So it is there. Uh, hopefully, we do not finish it all. I hope it uh, uh, is uh, replaced by something else very soon. There are two types of carbon cycle, the short term and the long term. And... Uh, the short term is exchange of carbon between atmosphere, biosphere, soil, and the ocean. And then we have a long term, which is a geochemical cycle, which affects carbon exchange between rocks and the surface reservoir, which is like biota and soil. So this is the rocks. And I'll briefly describe the long term carbon cycle in a moment. So, what it means understanding the global carbon cycle from about one year to about 1,000 years, 10 to the zero is one. Uh, that's uh, one to 1,000 comes. And the long-term cycle is about 1,000 to millions of years. So we will have both of those cycle brief examples. So in the long-term carbon cycle, which is uptake of atmospheric carbon dioxide by weathering of silicate minerals, calcium and magnesium silicates, and uh, weathering of ancient organic matter on the continent and burial of the organic matter in marine sediments. Uh, fossil fuel combustion by human is a special case because it accelerates the weathering of organic matter. The thermal breakdown at depth of carbonate minerals and organic matter via metamorphism, magmatism, diagenesis are the long-term uh, processes. Magmatism refers to formation of igneous rocks from magma and creation of mountains, which uh, eventually bury the carbon uh, on a long-term basis. Diagenesis, by definition, is change of sediments or existing sedimentary rocks into sedimentary rocks with decrease in porosity and therefore lead to lithification and long-term storage. So long-term storage, uh, Rocks, which I've said, is very large reservoir of carbon uh, in the material buried within the earth. The process is a long-term carbon cycle, weathering uh, of ancient organic matter, weathering of silicates. I think I repeated that slide uh, all over again. Um, the carbon cycle long-term, the ocean, soils, atmosphere, and biota, it shows B42, and 10 to the 18 gram, that's exagram. Peta gram is 10 to the 15. So that's 42,000 peta gram, the same thing as 10 to the 18. Soil is 4 times 10 to the 18. That's 4,000 peta gram. Atmosphere 0.8 means 800 peta gram. So those are the units. So here are the carbonates, which are in the rock, 60,000. Hexagram again back and rock organic, which is the uh, fossil fuel is one of those. And then there are arrows which lead to different processes 
uh, exchange on a long term cycle between 10 million and thousands of million years. And this long term carbon cycle is a geology study. For example, the class soil and climate at Ohio State. Uh, I teach short term carbon cycle, and Dr. Barry Lyon from geology teaches long term carbon cycle. We teach it, teach it together. Weathering of silicates, a simple equation, CO2 plus calcium silicate lead to formation of calcium carbonate plus SiO2. And calcium carbonate, as you know, is a long term, uh, it doesn't decompose quickly. So this is where carbon dioxide is absorbed by the weathering process and lead to formation of long term storage of uh, magnesium silicate, the same. These two equations are called Urey reactions. So these are long-term carbon cycle storage in the box. Uh, is basic. Uh, now, what we are trying to do is find some kind of silicates, which we can grind them, make them into powder, powder and apply to the soil to see if that can become, uh, activate the reaction, uh, speed up the reaction. So this long-term process, and I have a graduate student who is doing it, taking uh, silicate mineral powder them and see if they can weather. And there are many other people who are trying to study the same thing. If you're trying to burn the organic matter content, uh, uh, that's the reaction. And it's the same reaction which goes in this direction, photosynthesis, but that's not what we are trying to represent. If you burn the fossil fuel, that's what happens. Leads to release of CO2 back into the atmosphere. Now, how can we mimic the long-term carbon cycle to see uh, geologic sequestration, for example, um, improving the release of uh, uh, from the rocks and the burial of carbon in the saline aquifer are kind of mimicking the long-term carbon cycle. Oceanic sequestration, the same thing, uh, mimicking that. Carbonation, uh, these are reaction which occur over hundreds of millions of years, but we are trying to somehow accelerate them and see if we can uh, lead to a uh, long-term storage of carbon from the atmosphere. Now, um, we go to this short-term carbon cycle, which is from about uh, one to 100 years, that time scale. And the reservoirs are different. The reservoir carbon, now the units have changed. Remember the previous one, 10 to the 18, or 10 to the 15. Therefore, these reservoirs are ocean. In the previous slide, are 42, 10 to the 18 is the same. The units change. Uh, fossil fuel, I had four, five, and now I got 5,000. Soils, about 4,000 to two meter atmosphere. That number keeps changing. Uh, at the present, it's about 800 plus. Uh, you will see that in a moment. Biota is about 620. So. Exchange of these reservoirs amongst one another in the short term carbon cycle. And there is extremely little CO2 in the atmosphere compared to, for example, soil and compared to fossil fuel. So, if fossil fuel and soil change even slightly, the atmosphere can be overwhelmed. And that's exactly what has happened. Because we have burning fossil fuel about 10 gigaton a year. The atmosphere being so small, the magnitude of change part per million is very, very quick. And that is uh, what happens. Uh, we have overwhelmed the atmosphere. It's stock. So the cumulative CO2 for different uh, periods because of human activities, 1750 to 2022, 480. Yesterday, I was giving you these examples. <clears throat> the details are okay. 480 gigaton of fossil fuel carbon have been emitted into the atmosphere since 1750. Compared to the land use change over the same period of 250, over the same period, 1750 to 2022. Once fossil fuel started in 1750, Land use change did not start in 1750. Land use change started about 8,000 BC, 10,000 years ago. And from beginning of the land use change to now, to 1750, for example, 
which is now around troposphere in Canada, <clears throat> estimated 320 gigaton, 320 petagram. So 320 plus 250 is yesterday the number I was giving you 600, about, compared to about 450 to 500. So there is a slide where I saw total of that 250 is actually 550 and 600. So please remember that. Now the other part in this slide, which is interesting is uh, out of all these 480 and 250, 730 together, atmosphere has absorbed 300. And the ocean has absorbed about 200. And land has absorbed about 250. So land and ocean, 250 plus 190. 213, so 435 something, 435 out of 730, some of you divide it quickly, really about 60%. 60% of the anthropogenic emission have been absorbed by natural sinks, land and ocean, without our intervention. So if somehow we can intervene to increase the capacity of the natural sinks, which are land and ocean, can we absorb more of that? Now that does not mean that we are encouraging anybody to keep burning more of that, no. If this burning stops fossil fuel and we increase the capacity of these two, can we somehow absorb what we have made it in the utopic part? And that is the philosophy, that is the rationale of carbon sequestration. I'm not saying soil carbon sequestration, carbon sequestration, because carbon sequestration is much much better. And if you see it for a different period of time, you can calculate how much natural sink absorb. You can also calculate how much land absorbed. So for this period, 400, 610, land absorbed 200. So land is absorbing about one third without our intervention. Can somehow we manage the land in such a way that we can absorb more than 30%? That's the philosophy. This was a paper that the most recent one from uh, Global Carbon Budget Project, uh, that backward links to it. Um, just to give you a global carbon budget for one year, uh, this is the 2023 data out of the whole that sequence. And one year we had 10 petagram of fossil fuel emission, 1.1 petagram of deforestation in the tropics. Defor now this 1.1 does not include the soil cultivation. They do not have the information soil cultivation. So this carbon budget is incomplete. Why is it incomplete? Because the soil people have not done their homework enough to tell this carbon, global carbon budget, look, hey, carbon does not just come from deforestation. It also comes from other sources. Until we tell them, they will keep doing what they're doing. So that is incomplete, but whatever it is, it's about 11 emission. It's much more. Land use is conversion is much more than 1.1, but that's what we got. So out of 11 then, atmosphere we are almost half, 5.1. And ocean we are 2.9, and uh, land we are 2.9. So this is per year budget, what I showed you previous one was a budget. So 58.1% was absorbed by land and ocean together and 2.9 out of 11, about 25, 26%, one third, one fourth absorbed by land. And, but that, the important part to remember is that is an incomplete budget. Now, people who prepare that, they don't think it's incomplete, but we know that emission from land is more than just deforestation. So decadal mean components uh, on 60s, 70s, 80s, 2023, in the 60s, fossil fuel was only three petagram, and now it is 10. 
So over the last uh, 60 years or so, we have increased the fossil fuel conversion by a factor of three or four. And the land use conversion relatively is decreasing because the rate of deforestation is decreasing. But in fact, this column is completely incorrect or incomplete. And it will remain incomplete until people like you doing work on soil carbon can provide the global estimate. Global estimate. Somehow we have to scale up our plot scale experiment on emission of greenhouse gases and project it at a global level. Uh, a question was asked to me sometime this morning. Uh, when do you decide that it's okay to share? I think whenever you have that information through publication. May it be incomplete, but at least people who are providing now this value to realize that this is complete. That's a very important part. And we have to find out the land base. Here is an important part. As the carbon content emission is increasing, the land absorption capacity is also increasing. The ocean absorption capacity is also increasing. The question is, will you know, ocean acidification eventually lead to decrease? And will the land degradation eventually lead to its decrease in capacity? And I hope that doesn't happen. I hope we'll keep improving this land management options so that its absorption sink capacity. There is a term called saturation, but then such can there be option that the saturation point can be extended? I think this is an open question, uh, which really only can be answered by further research. Now, atmosphere is about 800 gigaton. I'm giving you the graphic, what is happening. And remember I said it goes up by 5.1. Last year, last year went up by 5.1 gigaton. And it's from fossil fuel of 10 gigaton. I'm putting now in a picture graphically what I gave you in a tabular form before. The 4,130 fossil fuel from which we are burning 10 gigaton. And then deforestation um, <clears throat> it's 1.1. That upper arrow here, 1.1 is what was previously 1.1 in a tabular form and 120 is photosynthesis and respired back 60. The 60 of the remaining goes into the soil and soil is gaining 2.9. I didn't know how to put this properly this morning. That's why you saw that sitting outside. That shows you my incompetence in making slides. And then from soil respiration goes back and then we got ocean and the ocean has a change between the atmosphere uh, 92.3 going into the ocean, 90 being emitted back. So the ocean absorbs 2.3. And this carbon cycle uh, is a global. And uh, people sometimes ask, why don't you do any other scale? It can be done at a national scale. It can be done at a state level for the state of Kansas, for example. It can be done for a a city, it can be done for a farm, it should be done for a household. And more importantly, you, each one of you should be, do it for yourself. I was giving you an example, if you know your carbon budget and carbon footprint, hopefully you'll make a decision, I'll decrease my carbon footprint 10% every year. Everybody does that, multiply by 8 billion, problem can be solved. Decrease your 10 footprint by 10% every year. But this is a global thing. It can be done at different scale. Scaling curve, something very important uh, that was started by uh, 1960 uh, under the guidance of uh, Roger Ruel. Roger Ruel was a professor at San Diego who asked his assistant, Keeling, to set up in Hawaii monitoring of the CO2 in 1960. And it eventually became what we famously called Keeling Curve. And uh, I've given you there uh, January 1, plus 412 parts per million, 2020, 23, plus 420, and 24 January, plus 423. And if you look at this curve, close up of it, it looks like this uh, one cycle, one year. And uh, this is the highest level in Northern Hemisphere. 
which is uh, one of the highest level in Northern Hemisphere. It's concentrated the atmosphere for the winter uh, because winter doesn't have plant growth. And it becomes uh, lost during the summer when the plants are growing. Therefore, this tells you how plant growth have a very drastic impact on uh, the global carbon cycle. And that uh, shows you how it is growing. Now, this feeling curve, if you look up at the close uh, up, it looks like this, the annual cycle. The main part to remind you is the difference between summer and winter because of the plant growth. And if the plant growth can do that much and somehow we can keep what plant grow within the land, uh, we could certainly release uh, the increase in the atmosphere. The, some of the challenges of the short-term carbon cycle, understanding the mechanism, of how the land ocean atmosphere reacts and how the mechanism can favor the absorption in land and ocean and how these exchanges uh, impact uh, the feedback. And feedback can be positive and the positive really the aggravate the climate change and the feedback should be negative. That's so we right. want agriculture a negative feedback. Now many times, you know, you hear- Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They finally got back with me and sent me the label. So do you want me to send that to you so you have it for next year? Sure. Okay. I thought I'd ask before I just yeah. sent it to you. Okay. Cool. It only took, I don't know, two and a half. You did that. <laughs> I think what I was trying to say that many times you hear people saying, we want negative um, emission neutral agriculture. And you hear the submission neutral uh, campus. Submission neutral. I don't know whether your campus is submission neutral or not. Uh, we want submission neutral Honda manufacturer, and you want submission. So agriculture people also say we want submission neutral. Has anybody heard that statement from there? Submission neutral. Anybody raise your hand that you have heard it? Okay. I think that is unfortunate statement. Agriculture has to be very, very negative emission. Agriculture is the only industry which has to be very, very, very negative. For one ton of carbon put it into agriculture, it must produce 10 or 12 ton in photosynthesis. That's the only way the atmosphere can become. So when agricultural people say we want to become emission neutral, I think they do not understand what they're talking about. This is very important. Agriculture is not machinery industry. Honda, yes, it's a good thing they become emission neutral. They do not have plants which photosynthesize. Our industry plants, they, they absorb CO2. They have to be very, very negative. I recently had a problem with the Indian Ministry of, we want to emission neutral for heaven's sake, no. You have to be very, very, very negative. And this part is very important to understand. So then the question is, what are the possible intervention to make it uh, very negative? The role of terrestrial ecosystem being a source of sink of uh, natural anthropogenic disturbance, enrichment of nitrogen, your group is studying here very uh, actively, uh, deposition of the sediments and climate change and soil carbon uh, this sediment deposition is very important part. But before these sediments reach the ocean, what happened to them between the, where they originated and the ocean, it's really a lot of emission. And we ignore that. By ignoring that, again, taking the sediment to the ocean, calling that as a sink without looking at what happened in between has created a lot of misunderstanding. The decomposition of organic matter content, increase in erosion, these are some of the things uh, that we have to really consider. So how do you short-term cycle can you can manage CO2 fertilization? Uh, I believe plant physiologists and others uh, studying that is a very important part. Uh, adaptation to climate and of course, management of soil to make soil as a sink 
talking about photosynthesis, C3 plants uh, are important components. C4 plants, uh, the mechanism of cactus and other area are very different. So understanding these photosynthetic mechanisms and how we can increase them are very important possibilities. Where is the management possible in the land? Degraded soils are very important. Uh, sink, uh, eroded soil, salinized soil, chemically depleted soil, physically degraded soil, mined land, drained peat land, and of course, uh, in addition to that, the cropland, plantation, grassland, all have potential sink capacity. But these parts eroded, more degraded the soil, more sink capacity they have because we have lost so much carbon from them. Where are the carbon pools globally located, which are vulnerable? Uh, the cryosphere. If the global warming happens, they have a lot of carbon now. Uh, possibly if they begin to melt, that could be a serious, uh, that's where permafrost I uh, mentioned here. High latitude uh, is another area which uh, contains more carbon, the boreal region, the temperate region. And if the climate change happens, they will become vulnerable or also uh, tropical peatlands, large carbon, they can decompose by climate change. And then of course the vegetation, which is subject to deforestation, uh, which means the forest, especially the forest in the tropical regions, uh, which are. So if we know this, we can probably talk to policymaker where we should do what so that uh, we can protect these resources. This region is most vulnerable uh, because of the management issues, because of the climate issues. So something needs to be done much more in that region as well, similar to what the topic, uh, the, the permafrost and other regions are. Himalayan Tibetan ecoregion is very unstable. Uh, it's very unstable geologically, and it also has a tremendous sediment load uh, the Ganges, Brahmaputra, Indus River, uh, especially Ganges and Brahmaputra carry a lot of sediments uh, which are vulnerable to decomposition and causing problem. One back to photosynthesis for a minute. Came back. Sorry, we fixed it. Sorry. <laughs> uh, this, this is the computer which does that. Uh, so the globe, uh, gross primary productivity is 123 petagram of carbon per year. 123. Remember, fossil fuel combustion is only 10. So what plants are manufacturing every year is uh, 12 times what if they are burning by fossil fuel. The trouble is uh, the net primary productivity is only 63, and the net ecosystem productivity is only 10, and net biome productivity is only 3. So out of 123, only 3 at the most remains in the biosphere terrestrial for some short period of time. But the <clears throat> actual 123 is very important. So the question really is how can that 123 be used in such a way? And here is another analogy that only 0.05% of 3,800 zeta zone of solar energy is absorbed annually as gross primary productivity which again shows here, and out of that, only three remains, and that led uh, Freeman Dyson to make a statement, if we control what plants do with carbon, the fate of CO2 in the atmosphere is in our hands. And that's what he's talking about. 123 petagrams are larger. How can we get hold of it? And how can we somehow manage to sequester it? So photosynthesis improvement, and how do you do with that photosynthesis so it doesn't go back again entirely is very important part. And one of the mechanisms to hold it back is soil. Soil has a very large reservoir of carbon in the terrestrial biosphere, the largest, and soil has two distinct parts, the organic carbon, and in some soil, like your soil, not a bio soil, but your soil, have also the lower part of it and the upper part inorganic. In the drier climate, inorganic is much more <laughs> than the organic. So 
So all the largest reservoir carbon, it's also the largest reservoir of plant nutrients, is also the largest reservoir of fresh water, and they're ordinated, and the largest reservoir of biodiversity. So soil is really the basic, uh, and the interaction between pedosphere means soil, and the other ecosphere, atmosphere, biosphere, hydrosphere, is really the basis which we should be considering. Then uh, Dr. Kosa also asked the question about the link between an organic and inorganic, which is very critical for this region, this climate. So first take the organic carbon. I was drawing this graph this morning also. The organic carbon is different components. We have live fauna, microbial biomass carbon, Dr. Rice and group who got a lot of work on that, and decomposed crotchet material and decomposed. Decomposed is protected and unprotected. Protected can be chemically protected, physically protected, biologically protected, unprotected, of course, the dissolved organ carbon, particulate organ carbon, macro-organ carbon. So your lab should have a facility to monitor each of those components. Then you got inorganic carbon, which is again, I do not do anything on it. But in fact, not many people do anything on it. Inorganic carbon, two broad components, pedogenic and lithogenic. Lithogenic is what came from rocks. Pedogenic is what is being formed in the soil by pathological processes. And those pathological processes, these are called pedogenic carbonates and pedogenic bicarbonates. They should be quantified separately. Bicarbonates get leached into the groundwater because they are soluble and they precipitate down there. So taking water samples from the soil and evaluating the bicarbonate content is very important measurement. Now the question that Dr. Forbes asked was the relationship between the two, this living biomass decreases carbon, decomposes carbon, and it leads to emission of CO2, and CO2 becomes dissolved in water from carbonic acid and precipitates into phytogenic. So they are interlinked. And this determining the central linkages for different farming systems becomes a very critical component. So our ability to monitor different components of this diagram and evaluate them for different land use and farming system is the most critical research that we need to do. Now, the other part, which is very important, and it came up in discussing yesterday, you got biomass, this wheat straw. And you want to return it to, and I was talking this morning, setting about some long-term permanent experiments of that day. But this weed start to eventually become humus, it had to undergo biogeochemical transformation. And that transformation is for this reason. If you take the CN ratio in the crop residue, it's 100 to 1. The CN ratio in humus is about 10 to 12. So humus is enriched in crop. If you take C to P ratio, that's 200 in residue. It's 15 humus. So humus is rich in, in P. And if you take C to S ratio, it's 500 to 70. So humus is enrichment of this residue by nutrients. So somehow you are making inputs of residue, whatever its cost is, and without knowing, farmer are also contributing nitrogen, phosphorus, sulfur, calcium, magnesium, micronutrients, which are eventually synthesized to stabilize the humus into microaggregates. Otherwise, it will go back to the atmosphere. And the pedogenic carbonates in a dry climate, if you dig up a pit, you might find some pictures like this. These are the decomposing, these are the final the depositing bicarbonates that get leached out and form a sheet on the soil surface. And these are the nodules with the precipitate as calcium carbonate and magnesium carbonate. And you can see them. You can pick up a pebble out in the field, and on the lower side of the pebble will be those same granules. These are bicarbonate. And they're very important monitoring their rate. So the rate in normally is low, but over long period, and the residence time is very large. So this is a sensory inorganic carbon sequestration process not being widely studied anywhere. So bringing it to sustainable soil management, 
in relation to carbon sequestration. Uh, and this year, one person came up with just the organic carbon. Remember, the question was here we have to replace what already removed. And in agriculture, unfortunately, it removes things because we require macronutrients. To say we don't want to add anything, think it again. So replace what is removed, respond wisely to what is changed, and predict what may happen so that you can do something about it and enhance soil resilience, this very, very critical part. So the process of carbon sequestration in a soil, anytime you change natural vegetation to agriculture, there's a decrease in carbon stock. Primarily because of the erosion, because carbon is a light fraction. And if the erosion continues, carbon keeps on declining. Most soils of the Midwest United States, Northern Great Plains, and stuff, have lost somewhere between 30 70 percent of the original carbon. And then it stabilizes if the erosion is controlled and you adopt better management. And I cannot recommend what that better management is. It will, over a generation, 25 years, following a sigmoid curve, reach another steady state. And this we define in terms of attainable potential. At that point, if you adopt another mechanism, uh, it becomes higher potential, maximum potential, which are the same level at the original level. And in some cases, like arid climate, yours, by irrigation and other system, it's possible to go beyond what was the original level. This can only be done by long-term experiment. This time we were talking this morning, where you can establish a long-term curve over one or two generations, like 25 to 50 year period, not overnight. Then take a slope of that curve and that gives you a long-term rate of carbon sequestration. You can determine many other things. You can determine carbon sink capacity. You can determine mean resident time, which is pool over flex. You can calculate uh, specifically identify practices, with such as conservation agriculture or regenerative agriculture, integrated nutrient management, integrated pest management, biochar, agroforestry, desertification control, many, many practices, afforestation, pasture management, water harvesting, drips, irrigation. We talked about yesterday, farming system. Unfortunately, each of these practices have their own carbon footprint. And therefore, you the gross rate, this is gross rate, minus the rate from doing those things. If you do no-tail cover cropping, it has carbon being added to do all that. And that is important, you get the net rate. Sometimes you don't see the net rate, you only see the gross rate, but that needs to be done. What should a modern agriculture look like? We have to have plants which are modified, which are improved. The plant that can communicate signals to communicate with the managers to molecular based signal, what kind of stress they are suffering. Plants which have large biomass, and this is where we differ from what Dr. Borlaug said. We want the short varieties, short stature, so they don't lodge. We want more biomass because our soils are depleted, and they have depleted in the last 60 years tremendously around the world. We want more biomass going into the root system. Unfortunately, therefore, we cannot focus on grains alone. That's the difference between the green revolution of the 60s and now. We cannot simply satisfy our belly. Soil also needs material, and we have been mining soil. So this biomass, we need it back. And therefore, we need harvest index, which is not as high as Dr. Borlaug wanted. We cannot keep that selfish. No, I don't, that, I don't mean negative to him. No, he's God himself. I worship him like God. But what he did at that time was absolutely good. Not now. We got to change. And I don't think he will resist that change. So we got to have something with large biomass. And with large biomass, it doesn't decompose. That's where we need input like that of Dr. Rice. We need root system, which probably has sovereign content rather than just cutin, which doesn't decompose as quickly. It stays in the soil as much as possible. Very prolific, deep, and bushy root system with mycorrhiza so that it can absorb uh, 
uptake of uh, phosphorus and it be grown with mulching with no tell cover crop always and we integrate these seasonal plants with of course trees and with the livestock integrate therefore 123 gigaton of carbon that plant synthesized and only three remain more can be both organic and inorganic and we create soil which are disease suppressive <laughs> and i'm talking soil microbiological thing and disease suppressive soil is those which are very high biodiversity so they can suppress disease to the extent that we don't need so much pesticide and we adopt integrated nutrient management because opium of course a very important part and you are still going to need nutrients and those nutrients and water should be applied directly to the plant root to drip fertigation in a such a formulation somebody said nano material yesterday in those formulations so that these nutrients are absorbed directly by plants and nothing leaks out. Everything absorbed. And that's where sensors and those things are very, very critical. And this is the future agriculture. You can do this in urban areas, probably using vertical farming or whatever. You cannot in those areas integrate trees and livestock, but basic concepts are very critical. So what happens is <clears throat> you have a sigma curve. And the sigma curve, the rate over a long period of time uh, is determined over a generational scale by taking the slope of that curve. But we have this period in which when you transform from conventional agriculture to, for example, cover cropping or water system, where nothing is happening. And this period may be two, three, four, five years. During that period, farmer is losing resources. And if we don't pay them, they're not going to do it. That's what I was talking yesterday. This is very critical period. Once they gone this over the hump, once they are on this part of the scale, they can probably keep going. But the initial period is very important. I use the priming the pump or whatever you want to call it. Uh, but we need to certainly reward farmer and reward them in such a way that they produce more from less. Less means uh, less land, uh, less water. And that's what I was talking about, returning land and water back to nature and uh, less emission. Uh, we want to return about 2 billion hectares. So that is where the basic of that technology. <clears throat> but at the same time, we create a car positive carbon budget so that the inputs of carbon into the land is more than the losses. Unless you monitor the losses, so therefore your research experiment have to monitor how much I was asking uh, this coordinator Nathan, if I could see the, his plots where they're monitoring runoff erosion and decomposition, so that these losses must be always less by the management uh, which is going in. So that's creating positive carbon budget. Unfortunately, globally, everywhere, including in the US, uh, the losses are more than the gain that we keep losing the carbon stock from the industrial biosphere. How to make carbon land-based sink uh, so that we are much, much negative, not neutral. Uh, Soils of the ecosystem, cropland, partial land combined, have a five giga hectare, billion, Hectare, uh, they should be managed uh, to make this uh, sink uh, by adopting some based uh, agriculture. And that brings us to carbon farming that I discussed uh, yesterday. Uh, so, linking what I did yesterday and today, the objective is to create income for farmers. Uh, about, uh, and when we calculate carbon credit, uh, please don't forget uh, all gases CO2, CH4, and CO2 in the relation between the carbon budget because the CH4 and N2 are very critical. So don't miss them out. And from this one, you pay uh, the farmer. And a, a carbon credit is one ton of CO2. And uh, it is based on integrating all gases, including uh, 
hydrochloroquine. Those are involved also. And the carbon trading is only one of the mechanism. There could be other mechanism as well. So uh, industry, somebody asked question, they are really very important partner and uh, industry is booming in this part. There are many companies coming up. My only concern is whether they are paying farmers properly. Uh, I won't name the company this morning. We discussed with some of them uh, and they mean well, but uh, are they able to pay them $50? That they really Assessment of carbon credit becomes, uh, and I, I know what uh, other people feel that they really need to monitor everything very critically. My view is uh, that is a waste of money. And I think it's a waste of, if we can adopt a model which uh, can give us estimates, even if it's plus minus 5%, and CRP was based on that model. We were not monitoring runoff and erosion under those plots. We took a picture satellite. We saw the land was set aside and therefore pay farmer. Same kind of thing here. We are going to do measurement on a basis of uh, land use by satellite rather than every acre monitoring on soil sampling basis, which will certainly cause a serious uh, setback in implementation of the program. Sustainable soil management, conservation agriculture, complex rotation. Take picture of those, evaluate their system, how they implement in a given environment, and say, farmer, do not create uh, additional hurdle. I have covered that top, but there was one thing came out the other day, and I want to conclude by saying a remark about it. And somebody said, uh, what you cannot measure, you cannot manage, you remember that discussion? And I asked somebody who said that? And uh, whoever he was, he immediately looked at the computer and said, Peter Drucker. And I knew that that was not quite right. Peter Drucker had something to say about it and I did not get a chance to explain, so I'm coming back to do that. Peter Drucker was very important and he was an influential Austrian-American author, mentor and a consultant who was considered the father of modern business. And he did use that statement, but he did not create that statement which says, what you cannot monitor cannot make. That statement came from Edward Deming. <clears throat> Edward Deming was the one who made a statement, no, who people think made a statement that you can't manage what you can't measure. They think Edward Deming said that. This is a misquotation of Edward Deming. Edward Deming did not say that. He said, nothing becomes more important just because you can measure it. It becomes more measurable, that's all. That was the statement he said. But that statement has been misquoted. What you can't measure, you can't manage. Now, I guess who, as a commodity, can misquote. You can also guess. But the reason I'm saying is that statement is not correct. I want to go back and explain to you what the discussion was. Measuring something doesn't make it manageable. It just makes it measurable. And measuring simply for the sake of measuring does not improve management. And we keep on measuring things. Sometimes I do not know why. Publication is one reason, but that doesn't mean you're managing. So we could have a whole discussion on that topic, but the other day we simply stopped and I asked somebody, do you know who said this? He said, Drucker. And I thought, gee, I need to come back and explain. That's not the case. And But more important is, please do not misquote Deming that what you cannot hear, you cannot manage. He did not say that. Who said it? Can you imagine? Industry who manufactures the analysis 
spectrometers and CN analyzer and gas chromatograph and PAS. <laughs> they are the ones saying it. Thank you. Thank you.